Chapter 16, February 16, 1943, Lodes Ghetto. I'd become used to hearing Esther sound afraid. By now, the quaver in her tone was almost as familiar as my own voice. But something was different now, as if there were good reasons why her voice had trembled, why I saw the unsteadiness of her feet through the small gap beneath the fence. Something new had unnerved her. And although I appreciated Esther's attempt to protect me, the fact was, being out here was hardly a safer option. Or if it was, I certainly wouldn't abandon her in there. Is it Germans? I hissed. She answered, no, but... That soldier patrolling the, this area was still headed my way, so before Esther finished her sentence, I squeezed beneath the fence, too. I left a long scrape on... It left a long scrape on my side, when I hoped I hadn't ripped my clothes. If it did, there was nothing I could do about it now. She helped pull me through the fence, and as soon as I was under, we stuffed snow into the gap beneath the fence. Unless that soldier looked carefully, he shouldn't realize we were there. Of course, there would be footprints in the snow and flattened areas where our bodies had lain, but it was growing dark, and I hoped that the heavy snow would mask that. I held my breath. until I was sure he'd passed, and only then did I look around, taking in the odd sight around me. Now Esther's warning made sense. A thin blanket of newly fallen snow covered what appeared to be a field of rubbish, layers of empty food jars, broken pieces of furniture, scraps of spoiled food. This must be where people deposited their garbage since the ghetto was sealed. Most of it must have been frozen, otherwise the odor would have been unbearable but it wasn't the reason Esther warned me away. Almost a dozen women were digging in the trash with sticks or large spoons, depositing whatever they'd managed to collect on old items of clothing beside them. They'd seen us come in, yet no one had said a word. Perhaps they had no energy for words. Most of them looked like they'd welcome death, and yet here they were, continuing to dig because something within them wanted to live. What are they doing? Esther whispered. Surviving. One woman appeared to be collecting anything that could burn. I'd seen this before. The only way to heat the apartments was with fires, but no wood was coming in from outside the ghettos. The people were forced to find wood anywhere they could get it, breaking up pieces of furniture, digging into the framing of their walls, or pulling the slats off stairs. This woman must be hoping to find enough here to provide heat for the night. Another woman was wearing a dress too threadbare to be sewn together again. Every time she found a piece of clothing, she held it up to herself to check the size. I had clothing in the bag that blackmailer took. I could have given it to her. Most of the other women seemed to be scavenging for anything that might be eaten, and from what I could see in their small piles, they weren't picky. Rotted vegetables, moldy crusts of bread, leftover scrapings from inside a jar, they were digging for what might amount to a mouthful of food, and only, if it was only half that, I was sure they'd still be grateful. We should give them the potatoes, Esther spoke in a whisper, yet I noticed ears prick up around me. These women weren't nearly as passive as they pretended to be. Let's get deeper into the ghetto and decide how to put them to the best use, I said, helping her to her feet. Don't look at anyone. Just walk on through. Esther swung her bag over her shoulder and I led the way through a sort of trail across the piles of picked over garbage. My stomach became sick at the thought of anyone eating it. No, it was sick at the thought of being in a place where this must be eaten. Ahead of us was a building that looked like it might have been a factory at one time. A few windows were broken out now. If I could get a piece of glass, it could be used to, as a crude sort of weapon, if necessary. And I could, if I could find a door, we could spend the night in there, out of sight, and then begin distributing Esther's food in the busier daytime hours, while we looked for possible contacts. Someone here who still had enough spirit to fight, to resist. Enough strength to hold a gun, if I could get another one inside here. As we left the rubbish pile, Esther cried out behind me and fumbled for my arm, but she was immediately pulled down to the ground. I twisted around and found two women fighting for her bag, even while it was still on her shoulders. They might not have realized or cared that her face was down in the snow and she was flailing about for air. 
Chaya! Her muffled plea for help didn't even register with these starving women. I dove for Esther, but when the first potato spilled from her bag, the two desperate women suddenly became become five, and then all of them fought for anything that was left. To get it off of Esther's shoulders, one woman knelt on her back. They were suffocating Esther, but the only thing that seemed to be in their vision was the bag. Stop! I shoved the woman off Esther, then pushed the others away until she could breathe. We were close enough now that I could see their eyes, stricken with horror at what they'd done. We meant no harm, a woman mumbled shamefully, covering her face to avoid looking at us. Esther stood beside me on wobbly legs, and I whispered, Let them have it. She wriggled free of the bag, which was immediately snatched by the women as they divided the potatoes among themselves. They might have killed me, she cried. I put my hands on her shoulders, steadying her. It would have been an accident. They only wanted the food, but we are surrounded by soldiers who will kill you deliberately if they get the chance. Never confuse the two. Esther's reply was cut off by the sound of whistles coming up the street toward us. Gestapo. Someone must have heard the scuffle back there and reported it. I tried the door of the old factory that I'd eyed earlier, but it was locked and the windows were too high. We'd never get in there. And we couldn't run back toward the rubbish piles. That's surely where the Gestapo officers were headed. <clears throat> and if they stopped to question us, it wouldn't be hard to figure out we didn't belong here or why we had snuck into a ghetto at night. I might withstand their torture. Maybe Esther wouldn't. This way, Esther grabbed my hand and pulled me behind a crumbled wall near the factory. No one had been back here in some time. I could tell because we created new footprints in the snow, which meant it wouldn't take the officers long to track us. <clears throat> but for now, we crouched behind the wall and the Germans ran by shouting orders at the OD who followed like dogs on their heels to find the cause of this trouble and stop it. I peeked out to see their guns drawn. Less than a, min than less than a minute later, a shot was fired. <clears throat> Maybe it was a warning shot, Esther whispered. Maybe they're urging the women to hurry back to their apartments. Maybe, I replied. But I knew better. With the officers momentarily occupied at the rubbish piles, Esther and I left the wall and ran deeper into the ghetto. The streets were nearly abandoned for curfew, and I had no idea where to go for shelter. Stop! A man shouted in Yiddish, a Jewish officer. The cock of his gun got my attention. It took all my courage to turn around and face this man. Esther had already stopped a few paces behind me and was visibly shaking. I was frightened too, but I couldn't let it show, not if I was going to talk us out of this one. Though it'd be more difficult than usual, I knew almost nothing about this ghetto. Not the streets here, nor the names of any residents, nor the Judenrat leadership. It wouldn't take this officer long to realize I was lying. I would figure out an excuse for why we were here. I had to. I must. But nothing came to my mind. And that infuriated me. I would not have my end come at the hands of my own people. That was intolerable. <clears throat> the Jewish officer's face was long and thin, as the Schmaltzkanek's face was plump. His cheekbones protruded at dramatic angles, giving him a harsh appearance. But I didn't think he was. Instead, he looked hungry, much like those women before. His gun was aimed directly at me, but Esther was almost hyperventilating, pulling his attention to her. She needed to stop. Rather than pity us, this man would despise us for weakness. Why were you running? His voice was raspy, sending a shiver up my spine. We were going to the rubbish piles to dig, I said. Then we heard the whistles and thought it might be an action. We ran. There have been no actions since last fall, he said. It's proof that the Judenrat's plan was a good one. Then his eyes narrowed. You two aren't from this ghetto. In that instant, an excuse entered my mind. I crept forward and put an arm around Esther. My cousin and I have been in hiding since the war began and were only recently sent here. We don't want any more trouble. May we go? He glanced back. toward the rubbish. We got a report of two girls sneaking into the ghetto. I think it's you two. He was being coy. He knew it was us, but he hadn't fired his gun yet. 
which meant he wanted something. A bribe? My money would do him no good. Some ghettos had their own currency, and I suspected Lodz was one of those places. Offering him Polish money was useless. He was sealed in, too. Esther stepped forward and pulled a small potato from her coat pocket. She must have managed to grab one in the fray. She held it cradled in her palms, as if it were a precious diamond. If we give this to you, may we pass, just this once. It's all we have, sir. He snatched the potato and stuffed it into his own pocket before anyone else could see it. But his face softened. Either you snuck in or you're trying to sneak out. One is as bad as the other. So if you are still here when I turn around, I will take you to the Gestapo. I thanked the man and we walked in the direction, the only direction we had left, away from him, away from the other officers behind us and deeper into a ghetto where we had nothing left to offer. Where can we possibly go now? Esther whispered. Come with me. A boy near our own age stepped from the shadows. He looked a little like I remembered my brother Yitzhak with a thick tousle of dark hair and a pleasant smile. My name is Abraham. You belong with us. Brings us to chapter 17, February 16, 1943, Lodz Ghetto. Esther tugged at my arm, warning against following this complete stranger, but I'd have followed nearly anyone in that moment if it got us off the street. Besides, my instincts about people were usually reliable, and everything within me suggested he could be trusted. There was something in his eyes when he smiled, in the friendly tone of his voice. I immediately liked him. But Esther and I hadn't come to make friends. We were looking for someone who could create a resistance cell. Was he that kind of person? If we went with him, Maybe we'd find out. With Esther gripping my forearm, we followed Abraham into a dark building with six heavy doors for apartments on the main floor and a wooden staircase up the back. The mottled plaster and dingy paint didn't bother me, but the smell did. It reeked of death in here, an odor that persisted despite the horrible draft. Perhaps the draft brought the smell in, for I'd also noticed it outside, carried like smoke on the breeze. This building is scary, Esther whispered to me. Abraham grinned, having overheard. It is, which keeps our enemies out. In a strange way, that made perfect sense, though I wasn't sure it made Esther feel any better. Do you live in here? She asked, trying unsuccessfully to stifle a cough. He shrugged back at her. The fact that we live is most important. We, I asked, your family? No, he stopped walking to look me directly in the eyes. Not anymore. A beat passed, maybe only a second, but it felt like hours before he smiled again with, a more, with more effort this time. Two of my friends are upstairs. It could be the start of a cell if they were interested and capable. Not everyone was. What would it take to spread the resistance here? Did Abraham have connections? Could he get money? Most of all, would he be willing to fight, to steal every, oppor at every opportunity, attack when possible, and kill if necessary? Even a year ago, I wouldn't have believed I was capable of any of that. Abraham began leading us upstairs, occasionally skipping a stair that looked weak in the center. Esther and I did too. We saw you hiding and knew you weren't from Lodes, Abraham said. Then we heard the shots and figured you two were in trouble. If you saw us, then you surely, then surely you've seen others come through here, like us. Other resistance fighters, that's what I meant, but I didn't want to be the first to say the words, just to be safe. Abraham glanced back. No Jews come into Lodz anymore. They only leave. How long? Esther avoided my eyes as she spoke. How long has it been since any large groups were brought in? He considered that a moment. Not since early last year. Are you sure? She sounded distressed and her whole body seemed to deflate a little. I'm sure no one comes and eventually we'll all leave, either on the trains or in the wagons that collect the dead. I caught up to him on the steps. It doesn't have to happen to you. There are options. I know, his brisk nod seemed strangely confident given the situation, but we don't need them. I furrowed my brows, confused by his statement. When we had a chance to talk in private, I'd ask what he meant. <clears throat> the final flight of stairs was missing every other slat. 
Abraham grinned back at us and demonstrated how to hold on to the railing for balance as we made the steep climb. It's scary at first, he said, offering me a hand, but once you're used to it, it's kind of fun. My idea of fun didn't involve slipping on a step and falling through the stair to the stairway below, but Esther nimbly jumped from stair to stair, even though her legs were shorter than mine. <clears throat> the top floor of the building had a dusting of snow from visible holes in the ceiling, and the draft was brutally cold. The layout was similar to the floors below, except only one apartment door still remained in its frame. The rest were missing. When we hesitated, Abraham opened the door and widened it for us to look inside. Don't worry, he said. You're safer in here than out. Don't worry? What kind of ridiculous phrase these days? We walked inside and I immediately noticed the other teenagers he'd mentioned, a boy and a girl, huddled next to each other in blankets. <clears throat> Their noses were red and they were shivering. Their fireplace was empty. Remnants of several families who had once filled this apartment were apparent, clothes left behind, someone's teapot, a set of dusty books. Lives had been abandoned here, just as this room had been abandoned. I wouldn't ask what happened to the people who lived here because I already knew the answer. I just hoped they had been strangers to these teens. Abraham introduced us to Sarah, who shared my sister's name, but nothing of her appearance. She had a closely shaved head and a wary expression that likely knew terrors about this war that I hoped I never would. The boy, Henrik, had nice eyes, or would have had nice eyes before the war. They were hollow now, like what I'd seen in my mother's eyes for far too long. I could only guess at the horrors he'd seen. I wish we had something to offer you to eat, Abraham said, sitting cross-legged beside Henrik, a lump formed in my chest. No, I wished we had food for them. We owed them that much. We're grateful to be here, I said as we sat, although I didn't like that we were facing away from the door or that we were on the third floor of this apartment building. If it became necessary to escape, the front window wasn't an option. I should have checked for a fire escape before we came in the building, but I'd been in too much of a hurry to get off the streets. That was a stupid mistake. We don't need anything, I added. The greater our need, the nearer our God, no? Sarah asked. And God is very near now, Henrik said with a smile. Or rather, he was probably very, or rather, he was probably very near to God. My fingers could have fit around his wrist, and I saw every bone in his face, the skin a thin sheath that had become tightly translucent. His ragged clothes hung with such slack on his body that another person could have shared the extra space. He was clearly starving, dying a little bit more each day. All of them were dying. Sarah nodded at me. Are you Polish? No. Then I saw her, where her eyes were focused on my Catholic's cross necklace. In all the commotion of getting in here, I'd forgotten to take it off. I fumbled to unfasten it and shoved it in my pocket. I'm Jewish, the same as you. You may be Jewish, Henrik said, but you're different. I took a deep breath, then leaned in. We're couriers for the resistance. Seeing no visible response, I continued, we can get things into the ghettos that people need, or we can get people out of the ghettos if that's what they need more. You're too late, Sarah said, a bitter tone in her voice. Where were you last fall? I shook my head. What happened last fall? The teens looked at each other, nobody wanting to speak first. Esther filled in the silence. We heard that something happened to the children here. Please tell me they didn't. Her voice trailed off, and from the heavy silence that fell on the group, I knew she shouldn't have asked. Henrik finally mumbled, What is it the invaders like to tell us? Arbeit macht frei. That's German for work makes you free. German for work will make you free. I'd heard that those same words stood over the entrance to the Auschwitz-Birkenau concentration camp, a place that existed for far darker reasons than forced labor. Our Judenrat believes work is, our, is the key to our survival, Abraham said. So when the Nazis demand a deportation, anyone who can't work has to go. <clears throat> Henrik picked up the story. The elderly, the sick, and the disabled were turned over to the Nazis first. We all lost loved ones then, and we still mourn for them. But something worse was coming. Last September, the Nazis wanted another deportation. My gut twisted wishing they wouldn't continue the story. 
I already knew how it would end, and that was hard enough. But once they said the words, I'd have to hear them over and over in my head. I couldn't stand that. But Sarah said, the Judenrat gathered all the parents together in the square and insisted that they hand over their children. Sacrifice the innocent so that the parents might survive. Naturally, the parents objected, but her voice broke. If they took the children anyway, Herr Esther mumbled, sealing the words in my memory. All of them, Henrik said. The rest of us are still alive only because we let them take the children. Another silence followed. And for the first time since, beco since becoming a courier, I had no idea what to do or say. My sister's face entered my mind, and no matter how hard I tried to erase it, just to be able to breathe again, I could not. Every ghetto I had entered could describe their individual children who had been taken away since the invasion, but I'd never been to any place where they were all the chosen sacrifice, offered up so that the parents might live. I thought again of my mother, how deeply it had wounded her to lose two of her children. I imagined that same thing had happened to every mother in the Lodes ghetto on the day that their little ones were forced from their arms. Esther finally broke the silence. If you want revenge on the Germans, there are ways to do that. Sabotage, for example, maybe in the jobs you do here. Abraham and Henrik exchanged another look, but Sarah only leaned forward. We will not work for the enemy. Not to survive, not if we die. I arched a brow. You won't work? That's why you're hiding here, Esther said. You don't want anyone to know. They know, Abraham said. It's only a matter of time till they come for us. Henrik tilted his head upward. We've given our lives to God. Whatever happens to us now is all right. I blinked hard. <clears throat> What is that supposed to mean? How can that be all right? We're ready for whatever comes, Abraham added. We're at peace with our decision. At peace, I nearly leapt from my skin. We are in a war. Our governments are at war. No, the Fuhrer of Germany has declared war on you and me, on all of us. I sat up straight, determined to make them hear me. We can get you out of here. Abraham frowned. Why? Why? I struggled to understand such an obvious question. To give yourself the chance to live. We want to live, of course, but that is in God's hands. I shook my head as hard as I wanted to shake him. Just because God allows something to happen, he does not mean he wants... Just because God allows something to happen does not mean he wants it to happen. Sarah touched my arm two fingers only, again sparking a memory of my little sister. If we escape, if we hide or fight, how does that honor God? Hasn't he commanded us to choose life, I asked. If you stay here, you are choosing death. No, we are choosing faith, Abraham said. The highest honor we can give God is to die in his name. Or fight in his name, I countered. That was the wrong thing to say. Sarah leaned forward. Hiding from the soldiers is one thing. Defending one's life in the moment is allowed, but killing them is different. That's murder. I paused, wondering again how many Nazis I killed the night we attacked the Saiganeria Cafe, or about the man I shot in the train yard. Were those murders or a defense of innocent Jews? Esther took over. Chaya and I believe that God wants us to save ourselves, and we'll save you if you come with us. The group stared back at us like we were speaking a foreign tongue, and maybe we were. Finally, Abraham said, I'm sorry, but we cannot leave. Faith will sustain us. I hoped that worked because they certainly weren't being sustained by food or fuel, or even the comfort of their families. You will die here, I said. Abraham, listen to me. You will. And when we do, we will take our place in history among God's chosen people, he replied. We will die with honor. His words echoed in my ears. My parents would die from fear and their love for each other. Others would die from a stubborn refusal to see the truth. The teens in this apartment would die for God, to honor him. But they all would die 
and there was nothing I could do about any of it. Esther and I whispered about, it, whispered about it later that night as we lay beside each other in the corner of the apartment while the others slept. You were too hard on them, she said. Because they've given up, I replied. No, Chaya. As much as the Nazis want to take our lives, they want to take our faith, too. We fight for one. Abraham's friends fight for the other. What good is faith if you're dead? What good is life without faith? A soft sigh escaped her lips, but she remained more patient with me than I ever was with her. We'll all die one day. No one escapes that fate. Our only decision is how we live before that day comes. Our path requires courage, but so does theirs. Both paths are ways to resist. What was your path, I asked Esther. Where were you before you came to Krakow? In the quiet darkness, I could almost hear the moment her breath lodged in her throat before she stammered. It's complicated. I've got time to listen. But after a long pause, all she said was, Good night, Chaya. That brings us to chapter 18.